in this next lecture. And this next lecture is strengthening the changed heart. This is a new section. Now supposing that we've worked through freeing our heart. Process I know, but we've worked through it. The heart is now free. It won't stay free unless you take some action. You can't be passive and say, now guilt is gone, now bitterness is gone, anxiety is gone. My heart is free, I run in the way of God's commandments. What we need to do now is strengthen our heart, strengthen our spiritual heart. And there's two primary ways that you can do that. By guarding your heart diligently, we'll talk about that, and by nurturing your heart constantly. Let's talk about the matter of guarding your heart diligently. Hebrews 13.9 says, it's good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace. You need to apply the grace of God to your heart so that it will be strengthened. And God's grace is available as we do that, but our responsibility, grace is there to empower us, but that doesn't mean we're to be passive. We cooperate with God. And what he has told us to do, if I want to guard my heart diligently, he says it this way, above all else, and I don't think that's hyperbole, I think he means exactly that, above all else, guard your heart. Why? For it's a wellspring of life. Everything flows out of the heart. Solomon said to his son, listen, my son, be wise. Keep your heart on the right path. Our hearts tend to go on a wrong path. Guard your heart because it's going to be assaulted all the time. Above all else, he said, that's the one thing to focus on. I've told you many things. I'll tell you many more things. If you forget everything I've told you, don't forget this. Above all else, guard your heart because it's the pathway to your emotions and all your relationships. And where the heart leads, everything else follows. In Proverbs chapter 4, very interesting where he says, guard your heart. Then he talks about your lips and your feet and your eyes, but they all follow the heart. So he said, if you guard the heart, you'll be able to control your eyes and your feet and your tongue. Guard, exercise great diligence. Keep the source from deadly contamination. We know it's like a spring. And if the source of the spring is contaminated, everything downstream will be contaminated. So you need to go back to the source, make sure it's clean, it's right, because everything else flows out of, out of that. And that's why we have said throughout these lectures, and we'll continue to say, behaviors aren't the primary issue. It's not your anger, it's not your sin. The primary issue is the heart, because all of this comes out of the heart. It's not your lust. It's not your struggles with pornography or adultery or jealousy or envy or strife. Those are symptoms. You've got to get to the source. That's why he says, above all else, guard your heart, because everything flows out of that. We saw that when we looked at Mark chapter 7, remember? Jesus said, out of the heart come every sin you can name, sins of the flesh, sins of the spirit. So above all else, guard your heart. Don't guard your heart because it's a criminal, but guard your heart because it's the wellspring of life. Now, there are many things we need to guard our hearts from, from any, any intruders. But I want to be more specific in this lecture of what to guard your heart against. And the reason I do that is because in the New Testament, there are several things that Jesus specifically says to guard your heart against. Guard it against all sin, against all intruders. But it helps to be alert to this because Jesus raised these things up and said, be sure and be on your guard about this. And let me go through those statements of Jesus. First of all, he says, guard your hearts against false teaching. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 16, verses 6 through 12. He said, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. What does that mean? Be on your guard against the yeast 
of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Yeast is sin. What was the yeast of the Pharisees? The Pharisees were the legalists. Obey the laws, obey the traditions, do this, have your external behavior looking good, make sure you wash your hands, you observe all the, the uh, out, uh, external rituals. And there are people today that will want to put you in bondage to legalism. To be a cre good Christian, here's a list of things you don't do. But that can all be external conformity to the law. I said guard against that because it has to be from the inside out, not just conforming the outside to certain uh, laws that people would seek to impose upon you. Sometimes churches are notorious for this. They have a checklist and you do these things, therefore you're a good Christian. Not necessarily. Man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. So he says guard against anybody that just wants you to follow rules and regulations and that supposedly makes you spiritual. What about the Sadducees? He said guard against the yeast of the Sadducees. They were the liberals. The Sadducees denied the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. And uh, there are liberal people today that deny the authority of scripture, the deity of Jesus Christ, the virgin birth of Christ, foundational truths, and it can be very subtle and it starts with an erosion of the Word of God, that that's not the authority. The authority becomes their mind or the church. And he says, guard against liberalism, those that would lead you away from the foundational truths of the Word of God. You gotta be on your guard. It's easy to slip into legalism. It's easy to move away from the authoritative scriptures and put man's ideas and opinions there. He said, keep on your guard against that. Check your own heart. Am I moving in those directions at all? Another one that Jesus says, these are all words of Jesus and he uses the word guard. That's why I'm on these. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Luke chapter 12 verses 15 through 21 is a picture of greed. A man wanted more and more building bigger and bigger barns never had enough. And our society in the United States, and I assume worldwide, there are so many things calculated to make you dissatisfied with what you have and make you want to have more. And it's a trap even the Christians fall into. I want more, I need more, I need a bigger house, a better house, a newer car, I need more money in the bank, uh, and I, I have a chance to get more. And in that process, their relationship with the Lord can suffer, their health suffer, their families is being diminished. He said, be content with what you have. That doesn't mean you don't improve your situation, but if that motive of your heart is just to grasp and get as much as you possibly can, Jesus says that's destructive. Above all else, guard your heart. If you find your heart becoming greedy, thinking about wanting more, getting more, how can I have bigger and better and more things that I can possibly ever use or need? He said, that's a trap because that will entangle you. And he said, guard yourself against it, subtle, because everything we hear is calculated to make us discontent with what, they, what we have or make us want to have more. Third one. Jesus says, for false Christ and false prophets will appear. They're going to perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect if it were possible. So be on your guard. Deception. Easy to get deceived. And the Apostle Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians, he said, I fear, I fear, lest as Satan deceived Eve, he'll deceive you from the simplicity and purity that's in Christ. False Christ, false prophets, you need to believe this doctrine, that doctrine, and people go on all kinds of exotic things and always looking for something new, and they're deceived away from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. And people get off on doctrines that have no basis in the Word of God. May take a verse here and a verse there, and you can make the Bible say anything you want it to say. 
I can prove to you that the Bible says there is no God. If I take a verse out of context, uh, Psalm 14, verse 1, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. I say, say there is no God. So you have to be careful of being deceived, of deception. And take everything you hear, everything that's taught, and see if it squares with the Word of God. Be like the Bereans. They searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were true. Does it square with God's Word? If it doesn't, you reject it. If not, you can be deceived by some false teacher, false prophet. Another one, Jesus speaking, be on your guard, <laughs> be alert. You do not know when that time will come. The warning there, I believe, is against spiritual slackness. Be alert, be on your guard. You don't know when the time will come. You don't know when Jesus is coming back again. Don't be spiritual slack and just live as if there's no tomorrow. Just have an eternal perspective. Live with the bigger picture in mind and realize how brief and how short life is and how uncertain it is. And stay alert. Don't get slothful. Don't get lazy. Don't get sloppy in, in your living, he says. But stay alert, because you don't know when the time's going to come. The time for your death, we have no idea. The time when Jesus is going to come, be ready, be alert. Be living in fellowship with him and with your priorities straight. The next one, again, Jesus speaking. Be on guard that your hearts may not be weighted down with dissipation, and drunkenness and the worries of this life. That's what we've been talking about. Destructive actions and attitudes. Be evaluating your life. Am I involved in some activity that's destructive? The drinking, the worries of life. I need to be on my guard if I let those things begin to intrude in my life. What about my attitudes? Are they becoming more negative, more critical? He says, be on your guard against dissipation, against drunkenness, against worries, against anything that really militates against staying focused on him and keeping the source clean. So I would encourage you again that are listening to this lecture to go just through this list that I've, I've gone through and say, where have I let down my guard? What am I not guarding? And how is that affecting my life and in the source. Know your own strengths and your own weaknesses. Which of these areas are you most vulnerable to? And um, by God's grace, uh, deal with that and guard your heart. Now that's sort of negative, but it's very important because Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart. Here's some specific ways to do it, but the point is, at all times, guard your heart. When I know my heart, is going down the wrong path, the wrong way. I've got to get it back right. I've got to clean up that source as quickly as I possibly can because everything's going to flow out of there. And if I don't guard it, I don't protect it, I let it go down the wrong path, I'll go down the wrong path with my eyes, with my tongue, with my feet. That's why you take time. And I've been recently taking time, the first thing in the, in the day, and I encourage you to do this. Here's the phrase, get your heart happy. Have a happy heart. Your heart troubled? He wants you to have an untroubled heart. What do I have to do to get my heart happy? I have to see what's making it unhappy, right? What have I done? What have I haven't, where haven't I guarded my heart? What do I need to confess? What do I need to empty out of my heart? What's bothering me? What attitudes, actions, whatever? And the first thing in the day, keep your heart happy. Get it free. Let it flow again. The Spirit of God flowing through your heart unobstructed because you're a clean vessel. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. 
For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com.